Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is Bayesian Nash Equilibrium, which is the solution concept we use in simultaneous move games of incomplete information. Before launching into the definition of Bayesian Nash Equilibrium, though, it helps to understand what needs to be different about Bayesian Nash Equilibrium as opposed to plain old Nash Equilibrium. And to understand that, we really need to think about the elements of a game that differ between situations with complete information and situations with incomplete information. With complete information games, we had three elements. We had players, we had actions, and we had payoffs that were a function of the actions that the players took in the game. With incomplete information, we have an extra layer of complexity. Not only do we have players, we have different types of players. Thinking back to the last lecture when we were looking at examples of this, you might recall that a goalie could be facing a striker that is either more accurate to his left side or more accurate to his right side, and the goalie doesn't really know which type of striker he's facing. So we have types here. And in order for the goalie to actually adopt some sort of strategy that's a good response to the different possibilities, we need to have beliefs about the types of players that an opponent is facing. For example, maybe the goalie has a 50% belief that the striker is more accurate to the left side and a 50% belief that the striker is more accurate to the right side. When we have these games of incomplete information, though, we usually go a step further than that. We use something known as the common priors assumption. So it's not only that the goalie believes that there's an equal probability that he's facing the left strong side or the right strong side, but the striker also knows that the goalie has that belief. And further, the goalie knows that the striker knows that the goalie has that belief. And the striker knows that the goalie knows that the striker knows that the goalie has that belief. And so forth. It goes all the way up. There are some models out there that will relax the common priors assumption. However, those models are a lot more complex, and so I am not going to be covering them in a Game Theory 101 course. This is a little bit more basic, and we're not going to be getting into things as complex as that. Nevertheless, these games of incomplete information still have actions, and they still have payoffs, but recall that the payoffs are now a function of the types of the players. Okay, so with that, we see that the big difference between incomplete information and complete information is these types and the beliefs about these types. So consequently, and unsurprisingly, Bayesian Nash equilibrium is going to differ from Nash equilibrium because of these types. So let's look at the definition of Bayesian Nash equilibrium. A Bayesian Nash equilibrium is a set of strategies, one for each type of player, such that no type has incentive to change his or her strategy given the beliefs about the types and what the other types are doing. That's a lot of words, but we've encountered a similar definition before. Everything that you see in red is what differentiates a Bayesian Nash equilibrium from a Nash equilibrium. We're extending the logic of Nash equilibrium now to situations where there are multiple types of players and there's uncertainty about which types that we're facing. So instead of looking for profitable deviations for each player, we're now looking for profitable deviations for each type of player. And the strategies that we're going to be holding constant aren't going to be a strategy for each player, but now rather a strategy for each type of player. And we're also going to be using the beliefs about the types to calculate the relative likelihood of facing each one of those when we're now looking for profitable deviations. This unit will have a lot of examples of Bayesian Nash equilibrium and how to solve for them, but for now I want to give a very simple example to highlight and reinforce the definition of Bayesian Nash equilibrium that I've just given you. So this is the game that we're going to be looking at. Here we have a one-sided incomplete information game, where player one can be two different types. Player one with probability P is an A type, in which case we have the strategic form on the left side of the screen. And with probability one minus P, player one is a B type, and we're facing the strategic form game on the right side of the screen. There's only a single type of player two. So player one has no uncertainty about what player two is, but player two has uncertainty about what type player one is. So it's one-sided incomplete information. Again, player one knows whether he is the A type or the B type, but player two does not know that. 
I want to highlight something that's a little bit tricky about dominance in these games with incomplete information. Imagine for the second that we knew that we were in this situation where player one was the A-type. If you're player two and you're looking at that game, just the game now on the left side, you would notice that left strictly dominates right for you. Four is greater than zero and three is greater than zero. So if you knew that you were in this A-type world, you would never want to play right. You would always want to play left. But we can't eliminate right as a dominated strategy based off of this information. And that's because player two doesn't actually know whether she's in this A-type world or not. She might be in this B-type world. And if she's in this B-type world, the opposite is true. Here, right strictly dominates left. Four is greater than two, and four is greater than one. But once more, we can't eliminate left as a dominated strategy because player two doesn't actually know whether she's in this B-type world and right, in fact, strictly dominates left. But we can look at dominance going the other way. Player one knows whether he's the A-type or the B-type. In this case, if he's the A-type, he knows this, and he can observe that down strictly dominates up for him. Four is greater than three, and two is greater than one. So player one as this A-type would never want to play up. He would only want to play down. And because he knows he's the A-type, he can eliminate up as a strategy. So we know that in any equilibrium, a Bayesian-Nash equilibrium, player one as the A-type has to play down. Going back over to the B-type situation, player two as the B-type knows that he's the B-type. And here for him, up strictly dominates down. Six is greater than five, zero is greater than negative one. So if player one is in fact this B-type, he's never going to want to play down. Up is always better regardless of what player two is doing. And so up has to be the equilibrium strategy, the Bayesian-Nash equilibrium strategy for the B-type of player one. So we've now solved for what the optimal strategies are for both of the types of player one. It now comes down to figuring out what player two is going to do in equilibrium. Well, let's calculate the expected utility for player two. Player two can either go left or right. She doesn't know whether she's facing the A type or the B type, but she knows the relative likelihood of facing each of those types. So her expected utility for choosing left is going to be three times P plus two times one minus P. And her expected utility for right is going to be zero times P plus four times one minus P. And to solve for what player two should do, we just need to compare those expected utilities. If left is going to generate a higher expected utility for her than right, she should play left. So if we set that inequality to look like this, and we do a little bit of algebraic manipulation, we see that player two would want to play left as long as P, the prior belief that player one is the A-type, is greater than two-fifths. So overall, the Bayesian-Nash equilibrium of this game is as follows. Player one as the A-type chooses down, player one as the B-type chooses up, and player two chooses left if P is greater than two-fifths, and by analogous argument of the algebra that we saw in the previous slide, she'll choose right if P is less than two-fifths. And we have that knife edge case where she can mix freely when P is exactly equal to two-fifths. So let's highlight something here. Let's look at what we have as the Bayesian-Nash equilibrium and compare it to the definition that we had for Bayesian-Nash equilibrium. To start, a Bayesian-Nash equilibrium is a set of strategies, one for each type of player. And sure enough, if we go back and look at what our Bayesian-Nash equilibrium is, we had one strategy for each type of player. There was a strategy for type A, and there was a strategy for type B. Player 2 only has a single type, and so player 2 only gets one strategy, which again is going to depend on P, that prior belief. If we had a more complicated game where there was two-sided incomplete information, where player two could be one of multiple different types, we would need to have more strategies for player two. Likewise, if there were more than just two types of player one, we would need to have more strategies for player one. But nevertheless, for each type here for this game, we have a strategy for each of them. Secondly, 
A Bayesian-Nash equilibrium requires that no type has incentive to deviate or change his or her strategy, given the beliefs about the types. And sure enough, the belief plays an important role in the Bayesian-Nash equilibrium that we found. Player 2 chooses left if P is high enough, and right if P is low enough. In other words, Player 2's equilibrium strategy depends on that prior belief. And that makes sense. When player two is more likely to be facing this A type, left looks preferable to her, whereas if she's more likely to be facing this B type, right looks more preferable. So it makes sense that these strategies need to be a function of the prior beliefs about the types. So that wraps up this lecture on Bayesian Nash equilibrium. And in the next lecture, I'm going to give you a handy tip on how to solve Bayesian-Nash equilibrium in situations that aren't as trivial as this one, where there's a whole bunch of dominance floating around. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope to see you next time. Take care.